Welcome to a special edition of the Hasidish Taste of the Parsha. What makes this edition special is that even though the shir did take place in Kilat Chaverim last night in Yerushalayim live, um, something went wrong with the recording and everything's Mina Shamayim, so that means the transmission is meant to come out this way. So welcome to a bit of a recap. I'm going to present it in a few parts and you can choose which ones you would like to listen to. And let's start. Parshat Zitzave opens the world of the Kahuna Gedola. And Kohanim in general, we find that Aaron is separated out from the rest of Am Yisrael and his children. But this separation and dedication is to serve. And it's mitoch b'nei Yisrael. It's from within Am Yisrael. Let's try to explore this a bit. Years ago, somebody told me he visited a certain synagogue in England, and it was a Yom Tov, a holiday, when usually there's Birkas Kahanim, and he was surprised that no Birkas Kahanim was said. When he asked the Gabbai, the Gabbai said, yes, we do have Kohanim, but we've decided to eliminate Birkas Kohanim. When he asked why, he said, it's barbaric. The idea that there's a caste system that is a member of a certain family who through no merit of his own is supposed to stand up there in front and bless me? Why? That's not the way we do things. I try to answer that complaint with the following image. I'm a coin, so I've received from my father and grandfather, that's what they say, and that gives me certain obligations among them, Birkas Kohani. Let's imagine that I'm at a minion which is populated by ten of the greatest tzaddikim, talmidi chachamim, in Am Yisrael in this generation. From all the different groups, Hasidish ones, Svardi ones, Ashkenazi ones, Litvish ones, Temani ones, all the different types. And I'm the only coin who's there. When it comes time for Birkas Kohanim, perhaps if one of them is a levy who will wash my hands, and I will go up and stand up there before all of them, they will respectfully stand in front of me as I give them the bracha of Birkas Kohanim. Now, if word got out in the town that so many great tzaddikim and talmidi chachamim were in that shul, a crowd probably would gather outside, and they would be waiting for them to come out. As the Rabbonim leave, everyone runs over them to ask for brachas, and nobody comes over to me. Now, I might think, hey, you guys are getting it all wrong. They were just inside waiting for me to give them a bracha. Why don't you come to the source? The answer is that it's two different types of bracha. The bracha that I transmit, and I use that word intentionally, with Birkas Kohanim, is basically activating a gene which was placed into me from Aaron HaKoyen. And that bracha flows through me as a coin. I'm a conduit for the bracha. It doesn't have to do with my own merit or level. If there is covered and there is covered that the halacha demands to be given to Kohanim, it's as carriers of that bracha, but not because they are intrinsically better than another Jew. This is why the one aspect that Kohanim do get their yeshakach for, their thank you after the bracha, is what we express in the last word of Birkas Kohanim, ba'ahavo. The more the coin gives the bracha with love, the more those pipes open, the better the transmission is. That's the tafkid of the coin. In that, we follow in the steps of Arna coin. Oyev shalom, rodev shalom, oyev sabrios makarvan latorah. That is a bit of an introduction to who Kohanim are and what they're doing. Now we can put into context a little bit the approach to the clothing of the coin Godel. The Chasim Sofer asks, how could it make sense for someone who's coming to serve Hashem to come in with royal clothes? They're described in the Torah as the covered Latiferes, but it's almost an act of rebellion or chutzpah to come into the king's palace with you wearing clothes that express royalty? He says the only way to put this in proper context is to realize the Gemara has a debate about whether the Kohanim are Shluche Didon, they are the emissaries of Am Yisrael, or Shluche de Rachmana, the emissaries of Akarosh Baruch Hu. And the halacha is that we're Shluche de Rachmana. So therefore, those royal clothes are to clothe one 
who is a shliach of the king. The royal aspects of those clothes are only because of the identity of this messenger as a messenger of the king. That is the beginning of putting these clothes into context. In the next piece, we'll try to take it a little bit deeper. Welcome back to part two of this week's Taste of the Parsha. As we mentioned, the clothes of the Kohen Gadol are there to express his work as a shliach of HaKadosh Baruch Hu in the Avodah that he does on behalf of HaKadosh Baruch Hu's nation and on behalf of his creation. We can remember also that Aaron HaKohen was not seeking grandeur. He wasn't seeking high position. He was the one, as Rashi brings in this week's Parsha, who has the Choshen, which is on his heart, he merited that because when he was told that Moshe Rabbeinu would be the one to take Am Yisrael out of Mitzrayim, HaKadosh Baruch Hu told Moshe, belibo. He will see that you have received that leadership position and he will be very glad in his heart. So that's our Nakayim. The emphasis that we mentioned, Mitoch B'nei Yisrael, that the Zohar HaKadosh mentions, that the coin really only is able to function because of his connection to Am Yisrael, expresses something very important. The Beis Yaakov of Ishbitzer says the following, one of the tools which we have in Teresh Baal for understanding Pesukim is the following. If you have something, Shehoya Bichlal, it was part of a general category, and then the Torah separates it out from that category, Lola Lamed Al Atzmo Yotza, when we learn something about this item that has been separated from the general category, we're not just learning it about the item itself. It's teaching us about the entire category which it came from. He applies this to the separation of the Kohanim. He says the Kohanim are still and connected to Am Yisrael. Am Yisrael, he describes, are like the clothing of the Kohen Gadol. Am Yisrael are the partners of the Kohen Gadol and the Avodah Hashem. So now when we see the aspect of the Kohen, which is so unique, that he is standing in a great connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, we learn that all of Am Yisrael have that inside of themselves. That's part and parcel of what and who we are. And it's very important for the Kohen to remember that. Let's look at a fascinating Gemara from Maseches Yuma. The Gemara tells us, Tanu Rabbonah, Maise B'Koin Godel Echod Sheyotzim Mibes HaMikdosh. We're speaking here after the Avodah of Yom Kippur. It was always a very joyous time, as we see in the Machzor, when the Koin Godel finished the Avodah of Yom Kippur, in which he went into the Kodesh Kadoshim. And when he left the Beis HaMikdosh, Havaka Azle Kula Alma Abasri. Everybody ran over to him. Everybody went to walk with him, to accompany him. Now, in the streets of Yerushalayim, Shmaya and Avtalion, the greatest Talmud Chachamim of the generation, the Nesim, the Torah leaders of the generation, were walking down the street. What happened? Shavku Didei, all the people left the Kohen Gadol, and they went to accompany Shmaya Avtalion. This was a natural reflex in Am Yisrael. Even though the Kohen Gadol has an exalted position, Chazal teaches us that the ultimate honor and position in Am Yisrael comes from Torah. Even a Kohen Gadol, even a, a sorry, a Talmud Chacham Mamzer, a Torah scholar whose lineage is one of a Mamzer, perhaps the lowest on the rungs of lineage because he's not allowed to marry into the Jewish people. If he's a Talmud Chacham, he comes before a Kohen Gadol, who's an Amoritz. So the people ran over to Shmaya Naftalion, and as Shmaya Naftalion progressed with their whole procession around them, they approached the Kohen Gadol, and they greeted him. They came, but the Kohen Gadol said something rather sarcastic. The Kohen Gadol said to them, Amarloin, Yesun b'nei amamaya lishlom. He said, let the children of the nation go in peace. 
What was he referring to? Of the nations. Shmaya and Avtalion were, depending on the opinions in the commentaries, either themselves Geri Tzedek or descendants of Geri Tzedek. In fact, their lineage in the non-Jewish world went back to Sancheirev, one of the kings who attacked and tried to destroy Am Yisrael. So he kind of gave them a dig, apparently because he was a bit miffed that everybody left him and went to Shmaya Avtalion to remind them of the fact that they're Bnei Amamaya, that they come from the nations. They responded to him in the following way. Amrile, they said, Yesum Bnei Amamaya Lishlom, let the children of the nations come in peace, the Avdu Uvda the Aaron, for they do the actions of Aaron, for the Lese Bnei Aaron Lishlom, but not, let not the children of Aaron come in peace, lo Avde Uvda the Aaron, if they do not, or those who are not doing the actions of Aaron. So Rashi explains what is this action of Aaron? To be Rodef Shalom, to pursue Shalom. Now we have to remember that peace is a rather poor translation of Shalom. Shalom is the idea of Shlemus, of wholeness. This coin Godol, who, and we have to realize that during the period of Bayesheni, there were Kohanim Gedolim who were installed by various groups who had power and were not always the greatest of people. And he was looking at his own pride and he was looking down on other people or trying to embarrass other people. That is not Uvda the Aram. Were they praising themselves by saying that they're doing the Uvda the Aram? They were expressing something very unique when they said that they are Rodfei Shalom. This is the way the Kajan Tzermagid explains it in his Sefer, Havadis Yisrael. He says, what this means is, of the Uvda the Aaron, and he says, this is something based on a teaching he heard from the Magid of Mezrich, that it means that those things that the Kohen Gadol managed to do on that Yom Kippur, in his Avodah, they were helping him do it. The Kohen Gadol is not separated from the people. The Kohen Gadol is going in as a shliach of HaKadosh Baruch Hu to do this avodah, but he draws his power, like we saw from the Ishbitzer, from the connection to the people. Of the uvda the Aaron means that we were with you on Yom Kippur. We were enabling you to do what you're doing. That's the shleimus of Am Yisrael. You have to understand this. To be Oved Uvda the Aaron means to be Rodef Shalom, to pursue that Shlemus and that connection, because that is the only way it works, and that's the true approach of the Kohen Gadol. Some more lessons about the Kohen Gadol from Sifri Hasidus, especially the Shem Shmuel, obviously, coming up next. Welcome back. I actually, before we move on to the Shem Shmuel, I would like to share a story that relates to the description we just saw in the Gemara. The Kohen Gadol is not meant to be full of himself. The Kohen Gadol is meant to have the Anova that comes from understanding that he is wearing these clothing of covenant Tiferes because of the task which he has been assigned. Just think about some of the simple things we see in the Psukim about the clothes of the Kohen Gadol. He wears the names of the Shvatim of Am Yisrael on him in two places, on the Choshen and on the stones of the ephod that are on his shoulders. He has the Tzitz, which says Kodesh Hashem, on him. All these things remind him that he is coming dedicated by HaKadosh Baruch Hu, for HaKadosh Baruch Hu's purposes to do the Avoda on behalf of Am Yisrael. And Aaron HaKoyen, had the special mida of busha, not shame in the negative sense, but that sense of, I really am not worthy of this, and I'm doing it because that's the task I was given. We find when Arna Koin approached the Avoda for the first time, Moshe Rabbeinu said to him, Kravel HaMizbeach, draw close to the Mizbeach. And why did he have to tell him that? Why didn't he just tell him what he's supposed to do on the Mizbech and he would do it? So Rashi brings down from Chazal that Aaron Akoin was embarrassed. 
he had, even though his kavonas were pure, a connection to the events of the Chet Egel. It says in the Medrash, he saw an image of a shore of an ox over the Mizbech when he wanted to approach. And Moshe Rabbeinu told him, Loma Atabosh, why are you embarrassed? Bekach Nivcharta, this is what you were chosen for. Chassidish Yisvarim explained that as the Kach Nivcharta, not just to do this work, you were chosen because you have that Mida of Busha. The very fact that it's difficult for you to approach the Avodah of the Koin Gadol, the very fact that you feel that you're not worthy to be the Koin Gadol, that's exactly the person who's supposed to be the Koin Gadol. So I'd like to share a story that I enjoyed very much that I saw years ago and found again yesterday. It was told by the Vision Surebi, the name Chaim Zatzal, and it was about a chassid of Reb Naftali of Rupshitz. Reb Naftali of Rupshitz, like many Hasidish Rebbe's, had some Hasidim of special Midas, special Kedusha, who dedicated their lives to going to the Rebbe's base Medrash for large periods of time and devoting themselves entirely to Torah and Tefillah. They were called Yoshvim, the ones who sit in the base Medrash. So one of these Yoshvim was a man named Rabbi Yitzchak, and he lived in a village, but he would travel to Rupshitz at times to be a Yoshiv in the base Medrash. His wife supported him in this and tried to bring what Parnassa she could for the family. But the family grew and he was blessed with many daughters. And as the oldest daughter became of marriageable age, his wife approached him and said, what are we gonna to do? To marry off a daughter takes money. Aside from a dowry, the expenses of a wedding, of the needs of the things that are there, what are we going to do? So he said to her, what are we going to do? Do you want me to stop learning and to go out to the marketplace? She said, no, I'm not asking you to do that. I'm very happy with the learning that you're doing. I don't want that to change. But your chassid of the Rav Rebbe, please go into him and ask him, what we should do, ask for bracha, ask for etzah. He was reluctant. He said, I really don't want to bother the Rebbe with my expenses, with things like that. And she said, this is your obligation as a father. This is part of Avodah Hashem. You must do it. So he agreed that when he next went into the Rebbe, he would speak to him. But when he went into the Rebbe, he got so caught up in the discussions of Torah that he wanted to have with the Rebbe, he forgot. He came home, his wife was waiting for him to hear what the Rebbe said, and was rather disappointed. She told him, the next time you go, you must speak to the Rebbe. If not, I'm going to go in there and tell him that you are not doing what you're supposed to, and that you have to give us some instruction. He said, fine, I'll, I'll do it the next time. On his next trip to the Rebbe, he went in to the Rebbe, and the Rebbe himself asked him, he said, tell me, your oldest daughter, Shandal, how old is she now? He told him. He says, no, it's time to find a good chassan for her. How are you prepared for the wedding expenses? He told the Rebbe, he said, I'm on zero. So the Rebbe thought, he said, okay, here's what you have to do. There's a town called Dorna. It's a summer resort town. It's the winter now, but I still want you to go there. I want you to go there for a Shabbos. You don't have to spend long. Go on a Thursday, come back on Sunday. From there, you'll have a Yeshua. Okay, he came home and his wife was waiting for him. His daughter was waiting. What did he say? What did he say? He said, it's very strange. He told me I have to go to this town, Durna, for Shabbos. Okay, it was a Hasidic family. The Rebbe said his wife tried to pack him up some things. He had no idea how he was going to get there. He didn't have money for transportation. He didn't want to schlep so much because he was going to be walking through the snow. So since he was leaving on a Thursday already, he decided he would just go in his Shabbos clothes. He put his kind of raggy strimal on and started walking along the main road, hitching rides. Baruch Hashem, there were kind Jews who gave him a ride from place to place. And by the afternoon, he managed to make it to Durna. He walked into this town. Usually in the summer, it was a town that was very full of people who were vacationing, especially great Rabbonim. Used to go there for the fresh air and to rest up in the summer. He's walking down the road 
and he finally gets to one of the first houses on the edge of town, a simple house. And the woman who lived in that house looked out the window and she saw, like out of the storybooks, a tzaddik walking down the street. He had a long beard. He had a very beautiful face. He was wearing a strimal. And she thought, this is my chance. In the summer, the tzaddikim who come usually go to people who have better rooms to rent out. Here, let me have the schus of being the first one to bring the tzaddik in and take care of him. So she came running out and she said, Rebbe, Rebbe. And he looked behind him. He was wondering who the Rebbe is here. She says, come, come. You must be tired. You must be freezing. He says, actually, I am, but you should know I, I'm, I'm not a Rebbe. And she says, yes, I, I know all the Rebbe's say that. Please come, come into my house. So she comes in and she gives him something hot to drink and to eat. And meanwhile, she ran out to where her husband was and she told him, she says, you know, even though it's the winter, one of the tzaddikim came to the town and he's in our house. I'm taking care of him. And he's the real thing because I called him Rebbe and he tells me he's not a Rebbe. So the husband said, ooh, that is the real thing. She went to tell some of her friends. He went to tell some of his friends. People started to gather in the house to come give Shalom Aleichem to the tzaddik. And as each person came, his protests got stronger. He said, there's a mistake here. You got to understand. I'm a regular person. I'm just like you. I just happened to come here. Right? That's all. And they nodded their heads, understanding that the true tzaddikim speak that way. It came time for Mincha. And he walks towards the shoal. And he already has what they call a pamalya. He has a procession of people behind him. He comes into the shul and he davens Mincha. And then he's approached by the man called the Rosh HaKol. The Rosh HaKol was like the mayor of the Jewish community, usually one of the wealthier people in town. He says, Rabbi Baruch Habo, we're so glad that you'll be here for Shabbos. You'll obviously give us divrei Torah. You'll have a tish. And the people will be able to get brachas from you. He says, really not. Really, I just came to spend Shabbos here. I'm a simple person. He says, yes, uh, I understand. Totally. He says, with all due respect to those people who took you into their house, they live far away from the shul. There's a lot of snow. My house is adjacent to the shul. It has all the room you need to receive the people for you to do your Torah and Avodah. We're going to move you to my house. And so they moved him into the very opulent house of the Rosh HaKahol. He was set up, and meanwhile, the Gabbai from the Shul had already set himself up as the Rebbe's Gabbai. People got online, and he was helping them write their kvitlach, write a note in which they gave the names of people who needed Yeshua, who needed some kind of help in different things. And the people brought with them a pidyon, some money to give to the tzaddik. It's a way of connecting to the tzaddik. Some say that when the tzaddik receives something from the person, that obligates him even more to do everything that he can to help that person get out of their tzara. And so they got online and he started protesting this. He says, this is really not me. I don't do this. I've never done this. And the Gabbai said, please, these people are in terrible trouble. They're looking to you. You have to give them brachas. You have to daven for them. So reluctantly, he started taking the people in and they would give him the kvittel and he would look at it and he would try to explain, really don't have any great hopes for me because it is not my thing. And they would cry and he'd say, fine, you know, you should have a bracha for this, a bracha for that. And so it went. Shabbos was a grand occasion. The tish was set up and he was asked to tell Divrei Torah to lead Zmiras and he was eating himself alive. He felt like the biggest liar, like the biggest fool. He felt like it was a Purim spiel that was never ending. Finally, after Havdola, he started to plan his escape. He wanted to get out of the Russia Kahal's house and get out of town into the snow, no matter what it was, he just had to get out of there. So he packed his small bag and he was about to sneak out when he's approached by the Russia Kahal and his wife. They said, Rebbe, we've really waited until Everybody in the town had a chance to speak with you. We don't want to use the fact that we hosted you and did what we could. We did that L'Shem Shemaim. But we've been married for 17 years. We've had no children. Please, Rebbe, give us a bracha for Yeshua. And he told them, he says, this is beyond my pay grade. I, I don't do that stuff. But the wife began to cry. And she said, please, give us a bracha. I said, okay, I, I give you a bracha. You should have children. Hashem should help you. You should have children. She said, this year, this year, 
He says, may Hashem help you that you should have children this year. Goodbye. And off he went. He's trudging along the road. He gets to the main road and suddenly a carriage passes by. Who's in the carriage? His Rebbe, Rav Naftali of Rapshitz. He says, come in, Rabbi Yitzhak. And they drove back. As they're driving, he said, no, how is your Shabbos in the town of Durna? He said, Rebbe, it was terrible. You have no idea what they did to me. And I tried to explain to them and they wouldn't listen to me. And this is what happened. And look, I have this pile of kvitlach that they gave me of people's tsaras, And they gave me pidyonas. They gave me money. So the Rebbe said, give me the kvitlach. That's my job. I take that on myself. That's what I do. The pidyonas you take home so that your daughter can get married. And so it was. It was a very lovely wedding. They were very happy with the chassan. But as we said, he was blessed with many daughters. And in about a year's time, his wife said to him, okay, what are we going to do for our next daughter? He said, I can't really tell you what we are going to do, but I'm going to tell you what we're not going to do. I'm not going back to that town. She said, what if the Rebbe told you to go back to that town? He says, well, I'm not asking the Rebbe, so the Rebbe's not going to tell me. She says, if you don't ask him, I'm going to. And in fact, she did. And the Rebbe sent a messenger summoning him. And he said, it's time for you to spend another Shabbos in the town of Durna. He said, Rebbe, you know what happened last time. Don't make me do that. It was terrible, please. He said, it worked out pretty well last time. You have to go again. So he went back to the town for Shabbos. He walks down that same road, and that same woman saw him through her window, and this time she ran out even more frantically. She said, Rebbe Baruch Habo, we see your Ruach HaKodesh. He's like, what Ruach HaKodesh? I'm walking in the snow. She says, you knew that your bracha, your tefillahs were answered, and the Rasha Kol and his wife, after 17 years, had a baby boy, and you came for the bris. He says, I did? She said, of course you did. You're here, the Shalom Zohar's Friday night, the bris is afterwards, welcome. And so the Rosh Hakol heard that his Rebbe, the Tzadik who gave him the brachas, arrived, and he took him again into his house, and he said, we can never thank you enough. This has changed our lives. Thank you for your bracha. Thank you for your tefillah. And then a voice started in Rabbi Yitzchak's head. He started saying, you know what? I did give him the bracha. I mean, it's true, I gave the kvitlach to my Rebbe, and for sure, his davening. But, you know, I'm not a bad person, and I have been learning Torah for a long time, and davening, and maybe my time has come. Maybe this is the way I'm supposed to be revealed to the world, through my brachas. Maybe these people are right. And even though in the beginning he started to protest again that this is not me, he got into it. And as the people came, he received them with a glowing countenance, and he was dishing out brachas left and right. When it came to Shabbos, he ran the tish in a regal, rebbish manner, telling this one the thing, this zemer, sharing his divrei Torah. He was obviously asked to be the sandak at the bris. And then before he left, the Rosh Hakol and his wife approached him, and they said, Rebbe, we've made a decision. Baruch Hashem, Hashem has blessed us with wealth, with possessions, we have written a contract here, signed and sealed, that give you half of the income from everything that we have and ownership of half of all of our possessions for you and your family forever. And this way, we'll express our thanks and we'll be partners in this. And so he leaves very happily with his head kind of up, feeling that that was an excellent Shabbos. That really went well. When he comes back to Rupshitz to run in and tell the Rebbe what success he had, he comes to the door of the Rebbe's room, and the Rebbe's Gabbai is standing there. And he says, oh, Rabbi Yitzhak, this is so strange. Ten minutes ago, the Rebbe came out of his room and said, everybody can come in to me, aside from Rabbi Yitzhak. He was shocked. He said, why? He says, I don't know. The Rebbe didn't say. He says, it, it can't be. The Gabbai checked again. He came out. He said, the Rebbe said, not you. Rabbi Yitzhak was broken. He didn't know why this happened. He stayed in the shul. He tried the next day, the next day, the next day. The answer was still the same. He started to think, and he started to do tshuva. And one day the Rebbe was going out to go to a bris. He ran out before the Rebbe got into his carriage, and he threw himself on the ground, and he said, Rebbe, please, don't reject me. What's happening? The Rebbe said to him, he says, Rebbe Yitzhak, I came into this world to help simple Jews, not big Rebbe's. You are 
a person who gives brachas, who reads kvitlach, who saves people, who brings supernatural Yeshua's, I could maybe give you some of the kvitlach I have that you could daven for the people. He got the message. He said, Rebbe, I, I see the picture. I, I gave in to the Sahara. That wasn't me, and it shouldn't have been me. And the Rebbe then received him with warmth and kindness. Why was the Rebbe so harsh with him? For a person, number one, to be living a life that isn't his is very destructive. That means you never live your own life. You're living a pretend life. And if a person does take on that role feeling, yes, it's me and it's coming to me, and these are the tzaddik's clothes that I should be wearing because I certainly deserve them, that itself disqualifies the person and makes it dangerous. So this is the way the Kohen Gadol would wear his clothes. Lama tabosh lekach nivcharta. That choice of the Kohen Gadol is because of that sense, knowing that his powers come from the fact that he's a shliach of Hashem, from the fact that he comes mitoch b'nei Yisrael. And the very sense that he has of this is important for him. In our next piece, we'll finally get to the Shem Shmuel who explained to us how the clothes of the Kohen Gadol protect him. The Shem Shmuel shares a fascinating insight from his father, the Avnei Nezer Zatzal, whose Yorzeit is coming up on the 11th of Adar. And he says that his father said the following to explain the clothing of the Kohen Gadol and the fact that the Levim actually didn't have a special uniform like the Kohanim. He said, Kohanim shehoyu pnimim. The Kohanim are internal. They needed the special big day kahuna to cover them. The Levim, whose avoda, whose ikra avoda was in sheer, was in song, la aroma kola, to raise their voices, he says, that is an avoda which is revealed, and therefore they don't need begotim, they don't need clothing. So this is interesting. We would tend to think that a person whose avoda is more external should have fancier clothes, different clothes to accompany that avoda. Here he's saying the one whose avoda is pnimi, which means that it's inside, it's covered, his avoda needs the coverage and protection of clothing more so. So this frames for us what the big day kahuna are doing. They conceal, they protect, they hide. Why? The Midah of the Kohen, he goes on to explain, is the Midah of Chesed and Ahava. That is the aspect of the Kohen and the Kohen Gadol. The Levim, actually, their Midah is one of Yira. And it's interesting to see how that combines with the idea of singing, perhaps for another time. The Kohen Gadol, who has this Ahava, needs coverage and protection. He explains through a story that his father brought down about the Kutzker, his grandfather. He said that someone once asked the Kutzker Rebbe, why is it that we see a decrease in the tremendous love that Hasidim had for each other that was there in the early years of Hasidus? Why is that disintegrated? What has happened? He said that the Kutzker explained that there was a Sha'ar, there was a gate of Ahava in Shamayim that was opened by Rebbe Levi Yitzchak Mibraditchev. Rebbe Levi Yitzchak Mibraditchev had such tremendous avas Yisrael, and as I've mentioned other times, let us not think that that didn't mean that he didn't fight against any aberration from Torah and Halacha. He was a tremendous fighter, but it was all from the Midah of love. He opened that gate, and that was why there was such evidence of such tremendous love among the Hasidim. But, when love is unleashed in the world, it can be taken to bad places. It can be taken to the wrong places. Love, chesed, breaks down boundaries, extends beyond boundaries, reaches out to others, connects with others in very internal ways, and that can be dangerous. So that Sadiqim saw that people were taking advantage of this shefa of Ava in the world in negative ways, and therefore they closed it. It's parallel to the or to that light in the beginning of creation, which HaKadosh Baruch Hu saw, could be abused by Rishoyim, and therefore 
was hidden away as well. So this is why the Kohen Gadol, whose avoda is so based on Ahava, on love, on bringing Am Yisrael to the love of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, of connecting them to the love that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has for them, of feeling love for every single Jew, as we saw that Aaron HaKohen would go out, and if he saw someone who did a chet, he would approach him, he would show him affection, and that would bring the person to tshuva. But that needs a lot of protective gear. Those begadim that Aaron HaKohen wore, aside from, as we mentioned, the tzitz that said Kodesh Lashem, and the different things that had the names of Bnei Yisrael, Chazal tell us how each beggar of the Kohen Gadol came to be mechaper on another Avera that Am Yisrael could have and that the Kohen himself could have. Right? These were the constant reminders of what he was trying to protect and repair. The idea of keeping Am Yisrael on track with HaKadosh Baruch Hu's plan. I heard from Rav Moshe Shapiro Zatzal that he said the word Kohen is made up of the word ko, which means like this, and the letter nun, whose numerical value is 50. 50 represents that which is above 7 times 7, that which is above all of nature, all of creation. Ko nun means the coin's duty is to remind Am Yisrael and to guide Am Yisrael that the way things should be here, ko, is based on the plan that comes above the very creation itself, from that 50th gate of understanding. So the coin's clothing reminds him of his task, reminds him of the idea of protection, of the idea of repair, of the idea of not swerving and not straying, even as his Ikara Voda was based on the idea of Ahava, of love. One example which shows this balance of Yer and Ava is in the Me'il. The Tolna Rebbe pointed out that the Me'il has a particular mitzvah in the Torah that it should have a strengthening uh, aspect to the fabric on its edges, so it should not be ripped. And in fact, it's a mitzvah in the Torah not to rip the Me'il. Why particularly that garment? That garment also had a very strange aspect of the Big Day Kahuna. On the bottom of it, we had Pa'amonim Vrimonim, these bells and these little pomegranate shaped things. What was their tafkid? How do they work? So the Svarim say that the Me'il, which was entirely made up of Tcheles, Tcheles represents the Midah of Yira. Yira is something that people have an urge to rip a bit. It's a heavy weight to have Yira Shemaim on you all the time. But when that's ripped, it can sometimes come to abandoning Avodah Hashem, denying the Ol Malchus Shemaim. It can be very dangerous. On the other hand, Yira, and exclusively Yira, can lead to sadness, can lead to despair, can lead to many negative things. The bells, which make sound. It says, Venishma Kolo, when the Kohen Godel would walk into the base of Migdash, you would hear the sound of those bells. The idea of raising a sound of music is one of Simcha. When we have the Bikurim, it says, Vanisa Vamarta, a person is supposed to raise his voice in thanking Hashem at the time of the Bikurim, and the Bikurim were a time of Simcha. So these bells combine the idea of Simcha with that idea of Yira, and that transmits the blend of those Midas to Amisra. In terms of what they're mechaper on, we also find something very interesting. The bells were mechaper on Lashon Hara that was said publicly. The Ketaris, not one of the clothing, but part of the Kohen Gadol Zavoda, that was a kapara for Lashon Hara that was said in hiding. Just as the Ketaris is in hiding, it's done inside the Mishkan, so too it's mechaper on Lashon Hara which is said in hiding. Why would the bells that have this aspect of simcha, why would they particularly be mechaper on the aspect of Lashon Hara, which is done publicly and out loud? And why is it we do have this differentiation, which we don't find with many other Averas, between what's done privately and what's done publicly? So the Rebbe explained that when a person says Lashon Hara b'chashai, 
He's trying to assassinate someone else's character. When a person says Lashon Hara publicly, he has another intention. Aside from creating a negative view of that person, he wants to do what Chazal called Miskabed Biklon Chavero. He wants to gain honor for himself by embarrassing or putting down others. That's why he's making that noise. And that, in fact, brings him joy. It makes him happy. It's a puzzle joy. It's a joy which comes from the wrong place. The bells of simcha and of noise and of public expression are connected intimately to the me'il of yira to make sure that we use that gift that we have in the right way, in the same way that the bells make sure that the yira is balanced with the simcha and ava in the way that we're supposed to be serving Hashem. That's but a small taste of the world of the Kohen Gadol and his special begodim. We daven to Hashem, v'hashev kohanim l'avodosam, u'levim l'shirim u'lezimram, v'imher v'yameinu, please have a wonderful Shabbos.